You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. How are we doing this morning? So yeah, we got a pretty cool show today. We are just, it's bank fishing. Everything bank fishing, questions bank fishing, the gear I use for bank fishing. That's right. So yeah, tackle. Um, if you guys uh, have watched any of kind of my pond videos or any of my other live streams, I really talk about this. My my philosophy when it comes to pond fishing in general, you either, you have to go to the end of the spectrum. You either want to go to the big end of the spectrum, you know, your bigger baits, your swim baits, your glide baits, or you want to go to the smaller end of the spectrum. And the reason I believe I believe this in my core is the pressure. The the fish in a pond get such a um, tremendous amount of pressure, especially if it's like a trout pond. So an example is Wilkinson Lake in Winchester, Virginia, in the heart of downtown Winchester. And actually, I can kind of get that place up for you too, just so you can kind of get a, a what that looks like. This is a place that I shot. It's in downtown Winchester. It's right next to Shenandoah University. The place is gin clear, twenty four seven. It's always super clear. It has a retaining wall completely around it, and it's insanely, insanely pressured. It's stocked with tons of trout, and it has tons of bass in it as well. But ponds generally get a lot of pressure, public ponds. I'm not talking about the ponds that a lot of YouTubers go to that are private, and only them and maybe two other people are allowed to fish in it. I'm talking about the ones that we all grew up fishing that are like next to a couple of ball fields in a soccer field that get pounded. Um, and so with that in mind, you need to approach it, kind, and this is, again, my philosophy, you need to approach it like you would if you were in California or a Japanese angler. I have learned so much about pond fishing just by studying and watching how the Japanese anglers over overseas fish their places because they only have like three lakes. I mean, they don't have a lot of water. And so you really have to get crazy with kind of your tackle and your presentations. And by doing this, I think you can get a few extra bites. So, you know, with that in mind, let's kind of let's get started. We're going to go from one end of the spectrum. We're going to go from the small end of the spectrum and we're going to work our way all the way up to the bigger stuff. Just as this is, this is the rods and reels first line, and then we'll get into the baits that I kind of bring. Uh, and I got a couple of little accessories you might like accessories you might like as well. So the first thing that I always bring with me an ultralight setup, no matter where I go, ultralight setup, because I'm not always just bass fishing. I do also like to bluegill crappie fish and trout fish as well. This right here is a Shakespeare ultralight five foot. I pair this generally with with a uh, sunline braid 12 pound test and then i use a leader material usually it's fluorocarbon but sometimes i'll go to mono and that depends on the type of bait that i'm using the key with that though with the leader material the leader material is the absolute key to this whole thing i carry with me at all times when i'm pond fishing three pound test four pound test five pound test and six pound test fluorocarbon line fish in these ponds are insanely sensitive like we said earlier to the fishing pressure dropping down line size is one of the biggest keys to getting bit in super super pressured situations this video right here that i actually have i have up you know one reason i was able to do so well is because i went down to like super duper super light line and this is again this is a uh, one of the videos on my channel um it's it's winchester hidden gems if you guys want to watch the whole video, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that for you guys here, but I was fishing stupid, stupid light line. I was fishing four pound test fluorocarbon to an ultralight rod, what I'm going to show here. And I was able to stick, you know, this very, very nice largemouth bass in a super highly pressured situation. Now the key is though, I wouldn't have gotten that bite if I did not downsize my line. I, I they're very, very line shy in, in places like this. And that kind of leads me to my next setup. Next setup that I always have with me, no matter where I go, is a spinning rod setup with a medium action rod. This is made by Phoenix. This is the FTX series. This is the this is the old this is the medium light, and I also have a medium. Um, I always have these rods in my truck, and this again, it depends on the type of pond I'm going to. This one in particular is the medium light, and this is what I use specifically to catch that fish that's on the screen right now. I also just have a medium. So if I'm fishing something that's a little bit more grassy, there's I'm probably throwing a little, something a little bit heavier, I have that as well. Now, I have this paired up with a Quantum Energy. I, I'm not brand loyal at all, whatever you guys can afford. The biggest thing is you want a really good gear ratio. 
this has 11 ball bearings. Daiwa makes some good stuff. Shimano makes some good stuff. All that stuff works out as well. But the key is with the drag, I have a great drag setup, 12 pound Sunline braid. And then here, I in this video specifically, I had four pound test Sunline. Okay, that I had to go down to. Um, and then if you guys want to talk about knots, we can talk about knots as well. It's a very light setup. I can cast multiple different baits with it, but I can get super finesse if I have to. And we're going to get back to baits here in a minute. We're going to go through all the setups. The next rod that I use, take that bait off, is this right here. Oop, I'm sorry. This right here is a seven foot Phoenix medium heavy seven foot FTX series rod. And I have that with a Daiwa Tatula. 200 series 6.3 gear ratio and i usually have between 15 to 18 pound test on this thing again sunlight and i go straight fluorocarbon with this um if i am fishing a crankbait a, a jig a heavier jig a swim jig a chatterbait something like that this gives me the backbone to be able to use that correctly, but it's not over the top. Everything in a pond, and we're still on the lower end, is downsized. And we'll get to the baits and why I pick what I do right here. Um, again, it's just specifically so I can be able to throw those, I call them finesse style power baits, like a smaller chatter bait, a smaller swim jig type of deal. And my other one, which is looks pretty much the same, this here is a Phoenix extra heavy, extra fast tip to Tula Reel. But I have this paired up with 30 pound Sunline braid. And the reason I have that is this is my frog and my swim, my light swim bait rod. Because I use braid, I can tie a leader material to it. So if I want to in a pinch and just throw a worm or something like that, I can. But this rod gives me the backbone to be able to fish those bigger baits when I want to. Now, I do have one more rod that I use in my, in my pond setup. And this one I actually just made a video on. This is my BFS setup. Um, this is made by Old 18 Outfitters. This is an ultralight, I kid you not, this is an ultralight baitcaster setup. It is a seven foot ultralight rod. And I have this again paired with a Daiwa Tatula. I don't have the new spool. Uh, you do need to get a, a, a different type of spool if you're not going to buy a, a BFS specific type of reel. Um, and I'll get to that more into that in a little bit if you guys want me to and i pair this up and this has straight four pound fluorocarbon now what's so cool about this is i can throw super duper small jerk baits crank baits i'm trying to throw trout magnets and things like that on there uh, but i'm having a little bit of trouble and i think it's because i don't have the proper spool quite yet so now that those are all my rods let's get into some other things that uh, these are um, some accessories that I think you absolutely need when you're going to go pond fishing. And then we're going to kind of get into the baits that I think that you need right now. And again, let me know in the comment section if there's something in particular that, that you would really like to like to see. Plug knocker. I carry my truck when I go fishing. I carry two different types of plug knockers. This is a telescoping pole style. And I also have one that I can hook on the line and throw down. When you're fishing a pond, you do not have the ability to take a boat or kayak over. And this has saved me so much money just keeping something like this in the car with me or the, or the truck, whatever you have. It can telescope out about eight feet. So if you do get snagged close to shore and it's just out of range, you can use this thing to, to kind of jizzle it uh, to try and jiggle it free, which is, dude, this is this will save you so much money, but I always have this in the car. The other thing for my kids out there, a pair of waterproof wading boots or waterproof boots. These here, I also have a neoprene sleeve for that go over the top of this so I can get into the water if need be. The other thing that I want you guys to get is a pair of sun pants and long socks. Now here's why, especially in Loudoun County, we have a huge issue with ticks and Lyme disease. When you are waiting the shore, it's not about a question of if, it's when you're going to get a tick on you. I highly, highly suggest for all my younger kids out there that like to fish, do not wear shorts when you go out to these ponds. Okay, get yourself a good pair of boots and get some long socks. Tuck your socks over top your pants. That way the ticks cannot get underneath your pants and crawl up your legs and, and latch on. I know it's a little stupid. It, it makes you not look fashionable, but it really will save you from potentially getting Lyme disease and picking ticks off of you. Um, you can also buy a pair of waterproof socks or wading socks as well. 
This way you can wade into the water if you want to, especially, you know, creek fishing gets really, it's, it's going to be explosive here in a couple of months. But um, I highly encourage you guys to do that just to prevent Lyme disease. It's a big issue. My sister has it. I always try to take those proper precautions just to make sure that I stay safe. The other thing, if you wear jeans or, or summer pants, it's going to protect you from barbels is going to take you from briars, things like that. It's, it's very, very important that you guys do that. So anyway, I know my older guys understand this, but just for my younger guys, please keep this in mind. Uh, it is very important. And now we're going to get into some baits. So honestly, this time of year, guys, I keep it, I keep it pretty, pretty simple when I'm going out pond fishing. Um, we're going to start with more of our reaction baits, and then we're going to kind of work our way through. Number one is the chatter bait. Of course, this is the pearl white. I usually pair that with a green pumpkin. This is the smaller version though. Um, again, when you're fishing ponds, you got to kind of match the hatch of what everybody is eating. They're not usually eating a massive um, Huddleston swim bait, though it can work. You have to pair down. The other thing I like about going with a chatterbait in ponds is I really, it's harder to throw a lipless bait without getting it snagged. Again, because we are limited to the shore, we got to think of baits that it will also be pretty weedless so we don't blow out the spots. Not necessarily just because you want you don't want to lose, you know, a 20 20 dollar bait possibly, but you don't want to blow out the spots. There's only so many hot spots on a pond and if you start snagging right into that that key piece of cover, you're going to ruin fishing for the rest of the day. So, a chatter bait here will also work to me as a lipless bait where I can hop and skip this on the bottom. The other things that I get into are my jigs. So I always have in my, my pond box, I have a finesse jig. This right here is the missile bait, uh, flipping and pitching jig. It's a very compact style. I can also use this for swim jigging. If I have to, in a pinch, this is a three eighths ounce. You usually don't have to go with a half ounce on ponds. You're not trying to just, you're not trying to throw a rock in there. You have to be subtle with the presentation. Um, I pair that with a, with a wild rage crawl style, but you really, again, it, it just, it depends on what time of year you're fishing. If they're pre-spawn, that jig will still work pretty well, but you're not going to get as many bites in a pond. Cause again, overall, think of it this way. If you're fishing a pond, you might have two fish that are over four pounds. Just hypothetically, let's say you have two over four pounds. If you're in a lake, a bigger body of water, you might have 10. You have a higher probability on a bigger body of water of actually getting more bites with a bigger presentation or more quality bites. Now on the flip side, because you're in a pond in a small body of water, you do have the potential to hook the biggest one there, but there's just not as many of them. So always keep that in mind. If you're going to be fishing like a chatter bait, well, how many fish there are actually going to be able to eat this thing? Let's say there's three. Well, you could probably catch those three in about 20 minutes. And then what are you going to do? You know, you can't just keep throwing it. You're going to have to keep adapting baits. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about here. Um, the next bait in my all arsenal is the 2.8 size Kitek. I like to pair this with a guppy head and I'll throw this on my super light stuff. Now, again, uh, a small swim bait or a small jerk bait like this Euro tackle jerk bait that I absolutely killed them on, absolutely destroyed them on last time is in, it's just insane because again in ponds if they're not trout eaters or bluegill eaters they're going to be eating fathead minnows predominantly and so a swim bait in a pond setting absolutely is a game changer because they're not eating shad they're not eating big tilapia they're eating generally speaking smaller forage prey and so this is where those mini swim baits those mini jerk baits absolutely shine pair it again with a light guppy style dirty jigs head and go with a sexy shad or that white chrome color or a black color, which is fantastic. I got two more baits for you here. And you know what? Since I have this one out, I might as well show this one too. The next one here is the Euro tackle jerk bait. This right here is a trout jerk bait, believe it or not. Okay. It is super small. It is almost the size of my pinky. They will absolutely kill it. Trout, trout baits like this, I'm really starting to become a fan of as I experiment with more for bass. Um, they're just the perfect size for pond fishing. You're going to get a lot of bites. I've gone past, I, I, I have pissed so many people off when I go fishing in a pond and I fish right behind people and I'm absolutely wailing on them because I'm switching to that smaller tackle. And now we're going to go to the bigger stuff. So if you want to actually try to have a chance at, at hooking something a little bit bigger in a pond, this right here is the 
There we go right there. This right here, Little Creeper by Trash Fish. It's the four inch version. And I pair this on a monster owner hook, three eighths ounce. And this is on 18 pound test. If you are trying, especially this time of year in, in the early spring, if you are trying to catch a little bit bigger size fish, this is fantastic. Again, it's a bottom bumping bait. In my newest video, I actually stuck a small one on this thing. And because it is so flimsy and soft, you know, a smaller fish can swallow that thing without much problem at all. But the color, the color matches most of the minnows that you're going to be seeing around here. It's just, it's, it's freaking fun. It really is fun. All right, now the super small stuff. Mike, Mike Capper, love wacky rigging Senkos and Zoom Super Flukes, Whopper Ploppers and Farm Ponds. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the Whopper Plopper is absolutely fantastic. And again, guys, we'll do another pond video in the summertime or a bank fishing video once we get closer to summer and we have those more specific baits. Uh, right now, you know, I'm not fishing a lot of topwater, even though they do, they do work. I'm just going to show you, you what I... Any pond I go to right now, anywhere I'm bank fishing right now, this is what I'm going to be using uh, right at this point. Smaller baits. This right here is the Zoom Green Pumpkin. Oh, let me turn that there so you can see it. Perfect. This is the Zoom and Green Pumpkin. This is the smaller version of the worm. Okay. The reason I like to go with this a little bit smaller version is I don't know if I don't know what size is in the body of water, I can get bit with this. And I'm going to pair this with a one odd Nico rig hook with a weed guard. I can fish this either straight shank or wacky, and then I can put a, a small nail in it if I have to. But generally speaking, you really don't have to throw a weight in there at all uh, with most ponds that you're going to be fishing. Cause again, you, you want that subtle presentation. If you're dropping a weight, uh, uh, you know, a, a half ounce weight into a pond, that's really going to spook them because of the pressure, because they're used to having being beat on all day. You want to make sure you have a subtle entry. So going with a Nico rig, uh, weedless Nico rig system is fantastic. Uh, the other, the other one, again, this is just, this is simple stuff. A stick worm, pure Yamamoto stick worm, three odd hook. No, it just, it can't get any better than that. Especially as the foliage and the grass and the pond muck starts to grow up. But you guys aren't there just for the basics. Y'all know that because y'all are educated and I know you are, you want the goods. So here are the goods. So that big one that I caught this really big one that I caught at uh, in Jim Barnett Park in Winchester. I'm going to show you exactly what I caught him on. When the going gets tough, tough get educated. Okay. And this is kind of what I used. I used this right here. This is the TRD Tiny Tube. A Tiny Tube, any brand, I prefer the TRD. You can use whatever brand that works for you, is lethal. I throw that on four to six pound test, generally speaking fluorocarbon to a braid leader this thing here and on a mushroom head by the way they do not see a lot of these bitsy tubes and especially if you're on a rocky type of pond uh just like jim burnett park dude they're absolutely going to kill that and again i think the biggest the biggest thing here it, besides the bait is the line size you have to be willing to downsize your line downsize that main leader line it, it they cannot see it as well the bait works a little bit more effectively and you're going to pick up a couple more bites um, the last bait that I will use consistently day in and day out is this right here. This is the uh, TRD jig, and I pair that with a their their version, the TRD D bomb. It's a bits of D bomb. This thing right here is a little smallmouth snack, but it is insanely effective on highly pressured largemouth bass. Just for giggles, when you're trout fish, when you are Bluegill fishing, because bluegill fishing is getting really big right now. I have a bluegill episode coming out here shortly. Gulp. Um, I love to fish gulp and trout magnets for bluegill, uh, specifically gulp. Pair that with a trout magnet head on your ultralight rod and make sure you super glue the gulp to the hook. That stuff is so biodegradable. Bluegill absolutely go crazy for it. Um, I always carry this with me no matter where I go especially when I'm, I'm seeking out those crappie and those bluegill. Now, I do have one other tool that I think you guys should get. How many of you guys tie leader knots in particular? What do you use? Do you guys use an FG knot? I use this thing right here. It's called the Knot Assist 2.0. You can buy it on Amazon. And what this thing does is it pops open and you can tie your main line across here and then hold it. And then you can, it'll spin so I can quickly and easily tie my FG knot. 
This I found while I was on Instagram and I saw a Japanese angler that I was following use this thing. What you do is you tie your main line here and it has some little clamps. Tie your main line there so it's straight and then you can weave your leader material right in. Boom, boom, bop. And then it's done. I have a little hook right here so I can hook it to my backpack. It locks and I can carry this with me. So if I have to in a pinch, I can retie my leader material. Um, I know a couple of people have been asking me like leader, not I tie. I do tie the FG and because of that tool, it just makes my life way, way easier. So basically when there's some strategies and stuff, um, we're just going to be playing some of, of these videos here because it'd be way easier to show you. So right here, this is a pond in uh, Percival, Virginia. It's right off of Route 7. And if you can tell by my angle, generally speaking, when you're fishing a pond, the biggest mistake that I see a lot of young anglers make is they bomb cast straight out. They go and they take that thing and they cast as far out to the middle as humanly possible. And, and to me, it's always been like, why? Think, have a purpose with your cast, have a purpose with what you're doing. In the springtime right now, the fish are trying to spawn. They want to move up, whether it, it is to spawn or just to keep warm. On this day, it was 62 degrees. It was one of the first, it, it was one of the first warm weeks of the year. There's a lot of wood in the water at this at this pond. The fish are moving up into those key areas to stage before they spawn. They're getting warm. They're getting ready. Most kids would just bomb cast straight into the middle. But what that means is that bait is not staying in that key strike zone very long. It's just not. And so what you need to think about, again, is where is the strike zone that these fish are going to be in? Are they out on that first break line? Are they right up against the shore? What is the main point, kill point or kill zone that they're going to be in? Now, the other thing that was interesting about this pond in particular was the depth. So. This is a perfect example. Sorry about that. So right here, if you can see this tree right here, all the way to my, my, my rod, it was about a foot deep from the knob of my rod into the bank out from that. It was about six feet deep. It was in extremely steep. It had a sharp break line. This is kind of important. If you know that there's a steep break line, do not just cast out cast with the bake break line parallel to it in this in this ep in this part right here i was fishing a small jerk bait right down the seam of that break line and that's where i was catching them on this side here but understanding that is is vitally vitally important when you're fishing a pond their ambush points because there's not as many of them it's not like a lake where there's probably 103 spots that they can set up there's probably only three or four and once you find those spots make a mental map of them because those are the key spots that they will reset up in you catch one, come back a little bit later with something else. Now, again, like this time of year is, is pretty, it's pretty easy to catch them in the ponds because they're moving up. They haven't seen a lot of baits. As you move closer and closer to the summertime, that becomes a lot harder because of the pressure and also of the vegetation and algae bloom that will usually come with that. Um, move back over here. So again, uh, this, this scene right here, I'm throwing that uh, that little creeper. If you can tell by my camera angle, I am casting parallel to the shore. Now, what I found out is as the day warmed up, those fish were getting closer and closer to the bank. What people will generally do is, again, they're going to bomb cast far out and you're outside the kill zone. These fish are looking at the shore. They're looking for little minnows, their little bluegill, things like that. that, are, that there's an ambush point. Whether you have cover or not, the shoreline is a, a ambush point. They can pin bait up against that, that shoreline. Um, and this was really evident in my, my Winchester Jim Barnett Park video that there was no cover in that lake. But the fish used the retaining wall not only as cover, but as a kill point that they could pin stuff against. And in this one here, you know, I was making cast after cast. right up against this right up against the bank and every time that i put that bait within three inches of the bank and was able to work it i was able to get bit if i cast it a little too far out i wouldn't get bit at all 
And again, and this kind of shows you, this is a bigger, you know, the American trash fish is a bigger swim bait and it completely swallowed it. And this fish, you know, wasn't even 10 inches long and it had the whole thing down its gut. You know, a big swim bait will still work in ponds. You just got to make sure you match the color and, and the profile correctly, you know. And again, a four inch bait might be considered big for a pond. Whereas if you're fishing, you know, California Delta or something like that, yeah, you can probably go with a 12 inch Huddleston. 12 inch Huddleston is probably not going to work consistently in a pond, but a four inch swim bait might, it might work extremely well. Um, so just, just kind of some th food for thought there. Now, getting back to the other thing was like about those ambush points. And this is kind of like the best example of it is this right here. So I was fishing. There we go. This is again, this is the Winchester part. And as you can tell, so the Jim Burnett Park in Winchester, it has a retaining wall that goes completely around it. Okay. And there is tons of rock. There's a little vegetation that'll come in every now and then if they don't spray and kill it off. But generally speaking, it, it's void. And so those fish don't have a lot of cover to hide in, but also to use as an ambush spot or a kill spot. So what they use is this retaining wall. And this to me blows my mind that I, I caught on to this. And I caught on to this. Uh, one reason is because I, I used to go to, I went to college at Shenandoah University. So I fished this pond a lot. But it's the fact that they would get, they would do two things. They would either lay right up against that wall when they're inactive. I mean, I'm saying it literally right next to the wall to where you could not even see them or they would be about eight feet off the bank staring at the wall. I kid you not. And what they would do is if you made any kind of cast that did not land almost on the shore, you did not get bit, period. You, you just wouldn't get bit very often. If you threw that bait, so it literally landed right next to that wall and you worked it, fish would shark eight to 10 feet out straight at the bait and eat it every time and kill it. But if you got that cast out a little too far away, they wouldn't deal with it. And it really clicked on me. like, Oh, they're using that wall as an ambush point because they know the bait has less places to go. It has to go either up left or right. It can't go back and they can pin it. That is extremely important to know. The other thing that you need to know when you're fishing the ponds is what they're chasing. Now, Jim Burnett Park, they have a ton of rocks and a ton of crayfish and little bitty minnows and bluegill. And they use those rocks to hide from the bass that are there. So using a small jig, a small tiny tube to mimic that forge is important. And you got to bump it around the bottom, crawl around the bottom. Another way that you can tell what they're eating is, again, how they're positioned. These fish in this pond not only were off the off the wall looking at it but they would also be nose down looking at rocks they'd be nose down not up the ones that were facing down were ones that you could come back and catch the ones that were just chilling in the middle of nowhere you couldn't what they were looking for is little things on the bottom and that's what they would do if if they were nose down and you cast you could drag it past them and get them to eat it Otherwise, you had to just bomb it against the wall here. And that really, you can really see this here on this video. Um, this is some of the coolest footage I've gotten this year, by the way. So as I'm reeling this in, again, uh, super duper light line. And I'm just slowly, slowly, slowly just dragging this thing along. Just stupid parallel. And I'm just bomb casting it around the shore. There's no one around. There's no one walking. You can see it's super duper clear. It's highly pressured. And you're making repeated casts. Now watch this. This is really cool here. You can actually see, you see that wake? That first wake is me popping the bait off the bottom against that wall. And then this thing comes up, you see it? And just absolutely sharks it. And that was, that's that big one that I, that I ended up catching that we saw earlier. And I'll, I'll just kind of do that again, because why not watch that thing? Dude, he came out of nowhere and just sharked it. And, and again, this is stupid clear water in the middle of downtown Winchester, but it's learning those little tricks of the trade with that with that body of water that are just so important. Now, do we have any kind of questions or thoughts before um, kind of I move on? Anything like that? Let's see, got one question here. How do you know what size line to start with? 
Uh, that is a very, very good question. The lighter the line you go with, the higher probability you have for a bite. So like with this uh, Jim Burnett Park uh, in Winchester with this fish, I, I know that they're super highly pressured. And so just going straight to four pound test, and if you feel a little sheepish, you can go to five. You're going to get bit more. You could go to two even, but you do risk breaking off a lot more if you don't have the proper rod size. But four pound test, you really would be shocked about how strong it actually is and the size fish that you'll actually catch on it. Like this one right here. Um, and this one was absolutely just an absolute monster. But again, four pound test, putting it in the kill zone, the right bait, right retrieve. And I was catching fish that no one else was catching. Absolutely fun. But yeah, so the lighter you go, the more bites that you're going to get. And so, yeah, if I was going to go to a pond that I've never been to before, I'm probably going to have four pound test and six pound test on my spinning rods. So I can throw a little bit lighter bait to see if that helps. I can throw, if you don't want to throw a swim bait or, or drag the jig, let's say you're going to throw a wacky worm, throw a wacky worm on. Oh, got a question. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, throwing a, a wacky rig on four pound test versus like eight pound test, you will get three or four more bites easily. I don't know. It, it just, I don't know why. Maybe there's someone more intelligent out there that can tell me why, but I've seen it more and more that that'll help. And again, guys, please, uh, if you could go to my YouTube channel, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. It really helps the algorithm fishing the DMV. Uh, we, we have a podcast. It launches episodes every Tuesday. We're going to be launching more and more episodes here shortly as well. Um, as we get into more tournament season, kayaks, kayak tournament fishing, bass tournament fishing, bluegill, crappie catfish, everything. And as we get closer to the summertime, we're also going to be doing podcast episodes on saltwater fishing. I also launch, uh, you know, informative stuff like this and also hidden gym series where I really discover really cool places to fish around here. Um, kind of getting back to this cause we got boogie here. Boogie, hey, good to see you again, bud. That's such a boogie. That's such a great bite. I love that we get to watch this. My go-to pond is exactly like this one. Very clear. I've caught eight bass this past week on my BFS setup. Cool, cool baits down under, down under underspin. Yeah, uh, underspin is a fantastic bait. And all guys, uh, an underspin, all an underspin is, is a swim bait with a blade. And I highly, highly suggest what you do is you can get screw in blades and I'll link that in the episode description down below. You can get screw in blades. So if you don't feel like going out and buying an underspin, you can get a, the blade that just screws into the bait itself. And then boom, you have an underspin. And then if the bite goes away, you don't need that extra flash. You can unscrew it and you don't have to cut and change every bait out. Um, yeah. And then boogie BFS gear. Let me, let me show you that again. So. Yeah, my BFS setup that I absolutely uh, demolished them with. I'll show you that right here. I take four rods with me and my bass really don't want to hit anything else over eight pounds. I can tell it spooks them a lot. Of the times I have moved to fishing my ponds with BFS, Seaguar six pound, and it works great. Yeah. So this setup here that I have for my BFS setup. Now, this again is an ultralight rod. This is made by nothing I'm sponsored by, guys. I'm just a broke college kid. So I do this all out of my own pocket. I don't get paid to do any of this. Um, but this rod I found while uh, a Googling, this here is the, this is the 18 Outfitters rod. Sorry. Yeah, old 18 Outfitters, ultralight seven foot. I have this ultralight bait caster setup paired with a Tatula 200 and four pound, again, you heard that right, four pound Sunline fluorocarbon. And then I'm throwing this small, this is literally just from that video I shot. This is a small Euro tackle jerk bait. Go to eurotackle.com and they have some fantastic, they, and they fish basically mini bluegill crappie baits. They have mini crank baits, jerk baits, and they are absolutely dynamite in ponds. Um, Because again, it mimics all those little minnows. And going to that four and six pound test will get you bit. I, I promise you, I, I bet my career on it um, and all the money that I don't have that you will get bit if you go down to lighter line and fish it correctly through the right part of the water column. That again, like I, I, I cannot stress that enough. You got to fish it in the right part of the water column. So then, you know, again, going back to here. Perfect. All right. I know the camera angle is shitty here, but um, just wanted to kind of show you this as well. Hold on. Your attack of stuff is really interesting because they build it, build it for y'all to perch. Yeah, James. It, it again. So what got me onto the Euro tackle stuff, believe it or not, um, 
was Fishhawk. We actually interviewed Fishhawk uh, for one of our podcast episodes. You can find it in the uh, podcast playlist if you'd like to go watch. It was a fantastic interview. So, but he talked about the Euro tackle stuff and he brought a bunch of it and we looked at it and I was like, oh my God, this stuff is freaking awesome. I've been looking for finesse stuff for smallmouth fishing, but then I started to apply it to my ponds and it was, it was just absolutely game on. You know what? Let me cut this off just so you guys can see it a little bit easier here. Cause I know I'm like, some people just chattering about it. And Jake's bait and tackle is going to start carry Jake's bait and tackle in Winchester, Virginia is going to start carrying this stuff. But this is the, this is the green olive color. And again, size wise guys, this is my pinky. Look at how tiny that is. Oh, and a key fact with this that I learned, I learned by fishing it. Don't jerk it very hard. <laughs> this is not like a vision one den, which was my fault. I was yanking that sucker so hard when I first got it. And this thing was like shooting off to the side. Cause I was just like, ah, now I could, I did have a five hour energy could have been that, but you don't have to just yank that sucker as hard as possible to get it to work and just, just light taps, light taps. So for you guys that like to weight lift or really like to like, just rip them really get really quiet and light with that, uh, with, with the jerks with this thing. Um, but it's dude, it's freaking awesome. And in, in this video too, again, this is on my channel. This is the last video that I posted. Uh, you can watch the whole thing if you want to. I don't want to bore you guys with that, but they were absolutely choking this bait. But anyway, the reason I have this up, I'm gonna show you this guys real quick. Boop, boop, boop. Okay. So a lot of wood in the water. This is very important. Do not bomb cast guys. I beg you when you go to a pond, if you see a lot of wood in the water, do not approach it. Do not bomb cast out into the middle. What I would like you to do, and I challenge you, get yourself parallel and work it. The first cast that you're going to make, the first cast, you're going to cast as close to the bank as possible. So stupid close that you're probably going to get snagged. Then your next cast, you're going to work out and then a little bit more. Hit it with another bait and then move forward. With the sun warming the... warming the. Blah, blah, blah with the, the, the sun's warming the earth really tom yeah okay i speak american by the way guys good lord with the days warming up wood hard cover is going to retain heat and those fish are going to sit on that bluegill crappie too perch it doesn't matter stay as far away from that as possible and make your cast but again think about your kill zones the bank the shoreline is a kill zone and people do not think about this because again when you're on a boat what do you do our kayak you cast the shore that that's where those fish are looking and even if and i've seen this before if a bass is on a on a lay down looking out into the middle of nowhere and you throw a, a little bait just two inches from shore and bring that back he will turn see that thing and run it down and kill it why because that bank acts as a as a wall that he can pin it against even if the fish is not looking at the shore if he sees something next to the shore like that he will try to run it down to kill it and so as I've, I've been fishing this, I started working from closest to me all the way down here. And again, I apologize for the, for the camera being, being a little, being a little yucky here. And then what I did is I worked my way back. I worked my way back to the camera, but again, all these casts that I'm making are super close to shore, working that bait back towards me. And again, they're just, they were absolutely just choking it. And this was, I think I caught. I had to cut the video down. I caught 15 and I cut the video down to five minutes. So I did have to get rid of some of the fish catches uh, just because, you know, I, I just really, really didn't want to um, have a super duper long video and bore you guys with it. But again, and this is real time. This was not cut, by the way. I caught him a back to back cast here, throwing this little, little jerk bait. And that's important. And this is something important too. All right. So this is a, just a little fishing pro tip for everyone, everyone at home. If they hit on a jerk bait or a crank bait, the front hook never change, never put that bait down. You're an idiot at that point. If they're hitting the front hook or eating the head of that bait, you have found an absolute winner. They love that thing. Now this is, it doesn't have to be every fish. So let's say you, you hook, you hook two. The first one just nips it. The second one takes that bait and just absolutely swallows the head. My light bulb's going off. Like, I think they actually like this bait. Not, not even though not every single one, 
ate it that way, if you get just a couple, that tells me I'm on the right, I'm on the right pattern. I'm on the right bait. I am not switching. If all of them barely just get the treble hook, that is an indicator to me that I could probably switch up to something else. But if I get just a couple, you know, 5% of those fish swallowing it really good, I'm going to stick with it because you don't know if the other ones, they were going to hit it that well, but you just pushed it out of the way before they could get it. So I kind of, I hope that helps there. Let's see if we can crush. Oh, and back. I've got some messages here. Uh, speaking of jerk baits, I've had great success this past two weeks fishing with my BFS paired with a, a, a junior baby bass fluke. I absolutely love a fluke. Um, yep. Boogie, you're absolutely right. I love the fluke. It's a really, really good bait. And we're going to talk about that one too. So uh, let's see. They absolutely hate it. I don't know, but it is, but it seems like they want to kill it every time. Yeah. They now the reason I don't have a jerk bait on here right now, the reason I don't have a jerk, uh, a soft jerk bait on here right now, generally speaking is I can get away with treble hooks. Spoiler. If you didn't know this, everyone, I know you guys all do. You can hook more things with a treble hook versus a J hook. And so if I, I'm going to throw a fluke if I absolutely have to throw a fluke, but you're going to decrease the amount of fish that you get. You're going to jerk it away. You're going to pull it out of their mouth. So for the ponds that I fish right now, anyway, there's not a lot of pond scum or gunk, which means I can get away with these tinier jerk baits with pond fishing in particular, as the weather warms up and gunk and pond scum gets on these places, less and less baits. You can actually fish effectively. That's why to me, like pond fishing is super hot late fall all the way through early spring that's when they're absolutely they're the hottest and honestly like winter time is my favorite time to fish ponds especially if you get a hot day you can throw that small swim bait bump bottom and you can actually catch some pigs um, but again so this jerk bait in this situation it was a sunny day it was a warming trend there was wood in the water i could throw that thing and absolutely just just smoke them now the other thing you can do on these cold fronts like today today's absolutely just disgusting outside let me let me show you that that as well of what I would do here. Boop, 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 boop. <clears throat> All right, so this is another pond in uh, Percival, Virginia, that that you could you can be fishing. Uh, this here it was it was January I think it was when I filmed this video here. But the key is, and this is still plays right now. It was a cold front. A cold front was coming in. I'm throwing that little Kai Tech. This little bitty Kai Tech right here that we talked about earlier. Yeah, let me switch this over so you guys can see it. I was throwing this little bitty Kai Tech right here. I broke, I cut it down a little bit. I bit it down a little bit. I was throwing it on a, a light guppy head. Now, the light guppy head is extremely important when you're dealing with these finesse baits or actually any a finesse hook in general. One thing that absolutely hurts people when they go to BFS gear, light gear, is they don't pare down their hook and their rod. If you want to throw a four pound test, you need a super flim, you need a more flimsy rod, a more forgiving rod than if you're pitching and flipping because on the hook set, you're going to break off every time. Okay. So that's where that rod's important. Having that, that lighter rod. The other part is having these smaller hooks. When you're fishing these baits, especially a small swim bait, what's happening is their set, the, your, the set of the hook is you just reeling in tight and creating tension on the hook set. Okay, you're not whacking on them like this. And so when you're fishing these baits, you got to keep that in mind. When you have a smaller, thinner diameter hook, it takes less force to, to punch through their mouth. When it's cold between now and maybe like a, late April, May, the water's still cold. The fish's mouth is much harder. As summertime approaches, the mouth gets a lot softer. So it's easier to get a hook inside them. So going with that thinner diameter hook helps you penetrate the mouth with that lighter gear without having to set the hook harder, which would make you break off. And that is, is insanely important. I think where people really kind of get hurt with, um, with finesse gear. Now in this one, and what's so important uh, about showing this is look at the current. <clears throat> you see how, the, how it's absolutely, there's just, just nothing. It's absolutely dead at this pond. Absolutely dead. It's, the air temperature right now in this video, I think was 48 degrees. That's the temperature of the air. And all I was doing, I was bumping bottom. I was slowly dragging that bait as slow as possible, hitting everything I possibly could on the bottom. Um, and every time you would hit something, the bait would quiver and the fish would come up and just suck it up. 
This is a deadly, deadly technique for any pawn. If you go, whether it's grass, whether it's a, a, a divot, something like that, bottom bumping a small swim bait when the weather gets super cold is a fantastic way to catch the biggest fish that are actually in the pond. And you can see like, I mean, this one absolutely freaking choked that bait. But the key is, again, you've got to know the sweet spots in the pond when the weather gets really, really bad. Um, for most farm ponds, like a farm pond, you know, a, a legit farm pond. It's over here. For a legit farm pond, there's a small divot usually. Um, there's not a creek channel. There's not a lot of standing timber. I'm talking like a, a complete fishbowl style of pond. There's going to be a small divot somewhere in that pond. And it might be something that you have to find when the weather's a little bit warmer and the fish are a little bit more active. But let's just say you know exactly where that, that place is, the juice, so to speak. When you're in that place, what you want to do is repeatedly make the same cast over and over again from different angles. And you're going to take something like this and you're just going to just slowly turn the handle and bump bottom as slowly as humanly possible. Um, and that's how you're going to get your bites. And usually they're just going to they're going to be right behind that bait. They're going to be right behind this bait. And as soon as it hits something, it'll quiver. And then they're just going to suck it up. And all it's going to feel like is just heavy weight. Reel down into them. And then you got them. So, you know, when if it gets cold now, go to that small swim bait. Bump bottom with it. Go to four or five pound test. Dude, it, it, it's absolutely a game changer. And you're going to catch some insanely nice fish this time of year. Again, I didn't even feel that one. It just absolutely just loaded up on the rod and just absolutely swallowed it. So let me answer a couple of your questions here. Again, do you guys have any questions for me? Gear, tackle, thoughts, anything like that? Let's see. Boogie. That 2.8 is a killer with a Matt 7. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, it, it's a fantastic bait. And again, like people be like, oh, this is a this is super finesse. -y. Not in a pond necessarily. In a pond, this might be the size of what they're eating. This might even be big. You know, most ponds, the key forage is bluegill and minnows for the higher part of the food chain. And the smaller part, it's going to be like those little, little trout magnets and bugs and stuff like that. So to, to be fair in the argument, I could make that a, a swim bait that's 2.8 to four inches long is considered big. Like my, uh, my big fish killer besides like a glide bait and, and boogie. Like I know we talked about this a little bit earlier. Oops, sorry. This is the little creeper by American trash fish. It's a four inch bait, but look how thick it is. It's a stubby little bait in a great minnow color. And it has tons of little fins on it that just love to just move and quiver. And I like to belly hook this thing. And what's nice about this one is it's like a bottom bumping bait like you would use for a Huddleston, something like that. And the idea with a Huddleston is you're just slowly creeping this thing along the bottom. And as you hit something, it quivers. The American trash fish or this little creeper does the same thing, but it has a great minnow profile. And this thing is super, super limp. It's super soft plastic. And dude, this thing, and I'll try to like show you with my hand comparison. It's not that big. It's really not. But you can have fish absolutely truck and swallow this thing, um, you know, without a problem at all was the same one that I used in that video that I just launched. That fish was about eight inches long. And I don't know if you guys can see it very well, but that thing is in his gullet. Like he absolutely freaking just railroaded that thing. And, you know, it's not that big a bait, but it's the profile that's really cool about it that I like a lot. Um, it's the fact that this thing, it even though it's a little bit smaller, it has that big fish, it has that bigger meal profile almost, if that makes any sense. And let's compare this. This is a 2.8 Kaitech. And this right here is the American trash fish. Look at the size. They're pretty similar size-wise. Not that, I mean, not that much bigger, but it's when I turn it. Look at the thickness difference. You see how this one's just way, way thicker? Let me pull that up to the camera a little bit more. It's way thicker. So it, it gives the appeal of that bigger of that bigger meal. So you you have a better draw power for the bigger ones, but it's still small enough that little ones will still try to take a take a go at it. And when the gunk gets really bad on ponds, or when you're fishing around a lot of wood, like I was in that video, you're able to still get that bigger bite and kind of bump bottom. 
And that's kind of what I really like about throwing this uh, American trash fish, this little creeper site on, again, a beast owner, a three-odd hook. Um, if you can get it in a half ounce, that's better because you want bottom contact the, the whole time. But this right here is absolutely fantastic. A three-odd hook, 18-pound fluorocarbon is what I like to use because just in case, because every now and then you're going to fish a pond and you're going to absolutely, absolutely hook a toad. And when you're fishing this swim bait, you want something like that here. Uh, but then again, bump it along bottom and it'll be very, very effective. But okay, what are your opinions on the mega bass dark sleeper? I got a few of them. One for my BFS setup and a three eighth ounce one for my other rods. Haven't had any bites, but it looks like it should crush them. Dark sleeper has too big a hook for, for a BFS setup. So yeah, for, for a BFS setup, I would, for BFS in particular, I would not use, uh, for the dark sleeper. And the biggest reason is the hook. The hook is too thick, in my opinion. Um, I've, I've used the Mega Bass Dark Sleeper before, not for ponds in particular. Now, I'm not saying you can't use the Mega Bass Dark Sleeper for ponds, but to me, the biggest thing is, is the softness of the plastic and the tail. Now, this thing has a boot-shaped tail, kind of like a Huddleston. But this is literally, this bait here is the absolute softest plastic on the market, period. I'm saying this is stupid soft. Look at how limp that tail is, guys. This is without me doing anything to it. It is super soft. It tears extremely easy. These baits don't last very much. But because of that, there's a lot of secondary action with this bait. And because it's so soft, fish can swallow this whole thing without a problem. And I can get away with this smaller size. And I can use a, a, a decent thin size hook comparatively. But I'm still not throwing this on my BFS setup. I'm still throwing this on a light swim bait setup. Now, if you want to throw the, the dark sleeper, I think you could go for it. Absolutely. Um, the thing is, I would not throw it on a BFS setup with four or five pound test. You're going to want a little bit more backbone to penetrate that, especially since you have that, that fin system to help guard the hook point. Um, and the other thing is just to make sure that you match the right color. Besides that, yeah, I, I, the dark sleeper could definitely work without a problem. I just prefer to have if I'm fishing around a lot of cover, I'm going to go with this hook here because I can get the bigger bites. So do you agree that bigger the bait, the bigger the the attack strike? Ah, great. Because I think it's it's kind of important to what you're asking about, about the bite window. Uh, it depends on the time of year and the clarity of the water. The clearer the water, the bigger the bite window, 100%. So Phil, just to kind of get back to your question about like bite window, let me get this up here. There we go, right there. So this, uh, Phil, this was from Jim Burnett Park in Winchester, Virginia. This was in December. But anyway, this place is super duper clear. I mean, gin clear. You can throw a penny out into the middle of this place and you can tell whether it's on heads or tails. That's how clear it is. A super clear place has an extremely big bite window. So the bigger the bait there, absolutely the bigger drawing power you have. But on the flip side, a smaller bait still has a decent draw window. This fish I catch right here, I threw this thing straight up against the bank, and these fish are staring at the shoreline, that break wall, from 10 to 15 feet out. They're just watching that. And I'm throwing a tiny, tiny tube, and I'm just dragging it against the wall. And as I pop this thing off the wall, this fish rockets over, sharks the bait, pins it against the wall, and eats it. Again, I was throwing a super tiny bait because it was so clear there was still a big bite window. If the water was a little bit more dirtier, a bigger bait is going to have the draw. However, the commitment factor is important. You know, are you throwing a bait that looks like something they're going to eat? You know, a bluegill bait, like uh, a glide bait, does it look like a trout? Are there trout eaters there? That's important. In Jim Burnett Park, there are a ton of trout eaters. You know, they stock the thing with trout all the time. And when the trout gets stocked, you can throw a Huddleston or a big trout glide bait and you can wreck them because that's their forage species. But if you go to a farm pond that doesn't have it, yeah, you might get one or two that'll have a go at it because it's different, but you're not matching the hatch necessarily. Again, it, it, it you know, I don't like to give hard and fast answers because in fishing, nothing's hard and fast. It's just, it's just not. And that's what's so much fun about it is there's no perfectly set rules. And that's what makes fishing this so much fun, in my opinion. Let's go... Underrated part of the sleeper is that it is the best skipping lure on the market. Yeah, I, I've heard a couple of my friends talk about that, that you can skip that thing under docks and everything. And the other thing about the sleeper too, like underrated guys, don't just throw that on a bait caster setup. Throw it on a heavy 
spinning rod. And if you guys watch my lipless seminar, you know that I'm a big fan of heavy spinning gear. If you can catch a tuna and a shark on a spinning tackle setup, you can catch a, a big bass on it without a problem. But you can you can skip that thing a country mile on really correct spinning tackle. Let's see another question here. Great information. I'll definitely take both your advice. Yeah, I, and, yeah. And, and if there's any questions, guys, after this live stream, please feel free to message me on my Instagram, Fishing the DMV, or on my Facebook page. Uh, please message me, and I'll try to help you guys out the best I can with any information as well as places to go. Um, and I'll kind of give you my picks of places to go in kind of the area as well. Underrated part of the sleeper. We just did that. It's best giving bait on the market. Let's go. Uh, the half ounce size can easily skip 30 yards with almost no effort. My favorite thing to use for docks and clear water. Yeah, like that's it's I keep hearing really, really good things about the skipping ability of that bait. Location is just as important as the bait size. Absolutely. Location, location, location. Now, now, Shane, um, if you're still in the chat. Location, do you mean on your, your casting angle location or location is in where you're fishing the bait? Please let us know in the comment section below what you mean by that. And guys, let me know, where are you guys going to go fishing this, this spring? Is there a pond in particular that you want to go to that you're willing to tell people about? Now, to me, it's one thing to say, like, I'm going to go to a private pond. It's another thing to be badass to say, I'm going to go to this public water and I know I'm going to stick them. Um, that really just shows your, I think, your your guts as an angler that you can go to a public pond and you know you that you're going to go there and smash them both yeah absolutely like yeah where and this is important if you're fishing jim burnett park in winchester virginia where it, it's you know where i caught this absolute this toad here you know this right here they are trout eaters 100 percent they're trout eaters here and so when they start stocking trout you can throw a trout imitator and absolutely smoke them if you're fishing um, I don't know, let's say example, a, a, a normal farm pond, throwing a 12 inch Huddleston probably is not the best thing, but throwing a bigger swim bait, a glide bait, something like that, that looks like a bluegill can definitely kill, especially the time of year. And the time of year to me is just so, so important. If you are fishing during the bluegill spawn, a bluegill swim bait or a bluegill, uh, shaped swim jig will absolutely destroy them or a frog. Uh, top water is huge as well, but you know, top water right now is not, we're a little bit closer to that season, but once we get a little bit into warmer weather, I'm going to go over what I consider my favorite, um, my favorite stream baits, wading baits, my later spring baits as well. We're going to do another live stream to kind of update it, but this is just for right now. Have you ever launched a kayak between little falls and snakehead Island on the Potomac river? I have not, uh, have you. If, if, if you did, how's the fishing down that way? I have never done that. It sounds like that's a tidal part of the river as well. Let's see. Uh, we'll be fishing Hunting Run, Mooney Lake, Able. Okay, Shane. Yeah, you're, you're down that area. Come out and join me. Jane, yeah, Shane, uh, send me a message, uh, Facebook or Instagram. And uh, yeah, let's try to make that happen later on this year. I would definitely love to come out and fish with you guys some. Always looking for fishing buddies. I always am. And and hopefully here shortly, I'll have a little bit more time. I can go out and do and launch Hopefully, I'll have some more time to fish more and do more fishing content. Have you ever launched? Okay, I answered that question. Sorry about that. Never fish private waters. That sounds very fun. As a 100% bank fisherman, it's great feeling when there's 10 people at your local pond and you can still get on a good bite. Yeah. Oh, dude. But it's like crack. I'm sorry. I, I It's so funny. I have I have my boat guys. I know my boat guys out there. Chris Arvin's one of them. Shout out to Chris Arvin. Um uh, he he likes to fish in crowds too. He's not afraid of it. But I have some guys that I know that if they see another boat, like if they see another boat, they get mad. They start cussing. They 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 condemn the god that they worship. They hate life. To me though, it's like crack when you can stick one in front of fifty people. Oh my goodness, it's like scoring a touchdown in the Super Bowl. It is awesome because it's all mind games, guys. It's all mind games at that point. Um, I literally can't stop sliding when it happens. I'm an introvert. So fishing around all other people, I don't enjoy that much, but that feeling is, yeah. When you catch a fish around other people, it's like crack. And, and that's the thing too, uh, that pond fishing gives you, it, it gives you just a really strong willpower to be able to get out there and deal with those hard circumstances and push through it. And being able to push through it is just so freaking important. 
And let's see here. Speaking of bluegill swimmates, what do you think of the baby bull shad and baby bull gill? I have both and I've yet to fish them. Uh, baby bull shad is, is, is really, really good. I will give you guys, we'll do a full seminar here on swim baits in the next couple of weeks. Uh, since we're getting closer to swim bait season. Um, I like the Matt Allen hard swim bait. I also have the, I think it's the Jackal. I don't know that I don't know the full name off the top of my head. I have it in, in my tackle shop. Uh, I'll bring that out too, but it's like a bluegill glide bait. It's a smaller version. I like that one too. Uh, American trash fish is also really, really good as well. I get the other big thing that's really good. It's just a, a small swim jig is also absolutely killer because you're just trying to mimic the profile of it. It doesn't always have to necessarily be perfect. Um, and then a big, super big like bluegill look alike. And I'll bring that out uh, is really good as well. Yeah, that is a little bit too far up river. Yeah, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. Leader material is super duper important when, when you're fishing these places. And you need to make sure that you have a couple of different leader sizes available. I always carry, you know, four pound test, five pound test, and I have six pound tests available in my car or in my backpack setup that I have. Um, and to be able to tie it, and this is important, you need to learn how to tie the FG knot. And what I'm going to show you right here is going to change your life. I'm going to show this one time. Uh, so you guys better be watching. This tool right here is the knot assist tool. I found this on Amazon. This thing allows me to take my main line and I can loop it here and here. And then I can easily put my leader material through here and I can twist it. And I can quickly and easily create an FG leader knot anywhere. Lock it back in place and I can throw it right there on, back on my tackle bag. This thing has cut down my learning curve on the FG knot so much. And again, this is called the knot assist 2.0 not assist 2.0 and i'll make a video uh with this thing at some point and i can guys can show you i have an overhead camera it'll work a lot better just for presentation so you can see me use it but again it is the not assist tool not assist tool 2.0 you can find that on amazon um it's absolutely fantastic for being able to learn how to tie that fg knot quickly and easily the other thing that I highly suggest you guys get is a stick plug knocker like this one right here. You can buy this from any tackle store. You can buy this from Tackle Warehouse, Jake's Bait and Tackle, places like that. This thing right here, it extends out about eight feet. It's compact to about, um, I'm sorry, it extends out to about 14 feet. It's about seven to eight feet when it's fully compact, but this will save you tons and tons of money. Um, especially because again, we're in a pond. We necessarily can't go get our baits. So keeping this in the car it's such a great little thing. You don't always need it, but when you need it, oh, it'll help you guys so much. Yep, going to buy that knot assist tool. Hate tying the FG knot out on the boat. Dude, I'm telling you, this thing right here, the, it's called the knot assist 2.0, Shane. The knot assist. Amazon is where I found it. I was I, I follow a lot of Japanese anglers on Instagram, and I saw them using something like this. Dude, it'll cut down your time of, of doing the FG knot tenfold. It is insanely easy. It has little clamps on it. Um, it has little clamps on it so you can wrap the line and it'll hold the line. I don't know if you can hear that. So it can hold the line snug and then you can hold that there and then you can wrap and weave it very easily. You don't have to use all your fingers and toes and things like that. It's a nice, it's a simple little tool. I have, I have three of them, just a couple of backups because I was afraid that they would run out sometime. It's absolutely a great tool. The other thing that's important, get yourself a good pair of wading shoes. Uh, Sims makes a good pair and get a neoprene sleeve or waders, hip waders to go with it. I, I suggest that so you can actually wade. If not, if you don't want to get the waders, just get a pair of waterproof boots and you can get a neoprene slip pad that like goes up your ankles a little bit, which is fantastic. And this is important for all my young anglers that are listening. Guys, pay attention here. If you fish Loudoun County or a lot of these ponds, ticks and Lyme disease are a very, very dangerous thing that does exist. Do not, even if it's like 100 degrees, go out in shorts and fish a pond with a lot of high grass around it. Okay. I just, I don't want to hear about anyone catching Lyme disease. My sister has it very badly. Um, and I just really want to make sure you guys are all safe. Wear jeans or hip waders when the weather is colder out. And if you're wearing hip waders, you really don't have to worry about ticks crawling all the way up you. If you're wearing jeans, what I suggest you do, and I, again, please, 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 
keep this in mind and do this. Take big socks and have the socks come up and over your pants legs. It doesn't look cool. It doesn't make you look hip, but it keeps ticks from being able to get up and underneath your pants and biting you. Again, it's it's a super simple thing that you can do that will keep you from possibly having a disease that it, it will ruin your life. And I know I'm not trying to be a party pooper there, just with my sister having it and stuff like that. It, you don't want to risk it. When it gets hot out, I highly suggest you invest in some summer pants. Get some summer pants. You can put your socks through them if you're not going to wear hip waders. Boogie, I have multiple friends and family with Lyme disease. It's not a joke at all. That can be very, very dangerous. Yeah, it is. And especially if you're if you're like if you're a if you're a boat guy, you don't really have to worry about this. But when you're bank beating and you're going through tall grass and weeds and stuff, you're gonna get a tick on you eventually. And it's the one that you don't find is the one that could ruin your life. So not to try to be like a Debbie Downer or anything like that, but again, summer pants, get those when the weather gets warmer, get big socks, throw them up over your pants, get some good wading boots. If you can find them, if not, get a neoprene sleeve to put over top of, of, of your boots that you have. That'll make them a little bit more waterproof. You're away from the ticks. Plus, you're not going to have burrs or thorns and stuff like that. It's very, very nice. Um, that I, I like. I completely highly suggest you get that. A net is really nice to have as well, an extending net. Uh, Fishhawk has a really cool one on his on his YouTube channel. I highly suggest you go look at that as well. And, I mean, that's about it for me here. Let's see. Everyone be absolutely safe on the water. Have a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you next time. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.